Thank you again for coming out this evening. This is the Deeply Formed Life. This is our second uh, class on this uh, book, and we are going to be exploring the topic tonight of racial reconciliation. So before we begin, let's pray. Holy God, I thank you for those gathered and those watching, and we pray that your Spirit lead us, guide us as we hear this presentation, and may your Spirit be in the middle of it. In your name, amen. The real question of Christian discipleship is not, can I be your brother in Christ, but can I be your brother-in-law? That's the way that this question about race was posed to Rich when he was in seminary. There was in a class, and he talks about how one other student raised that very comment, and he shared that. Who can't your family members marry? Who do you personally feel uneasy about having in your home? I love the way that he po poses this question because it is a direct challenge to some of the things that we may not realize that we carry inside of us. Maybe we grew up in a certain time and an age when it was just different. Maybe we have family systems and structures that we don't even know are influencing us and how we interpret our neighbor or see our neighbor. And so this very question of, it's one thing to be the brother in Christ, but could I be your brother-in-law, or could I be your son-in-law or daughter-in-law? And I love the way that Pastor Velota says that the matters of race remain one of America's deeply embedded thorns in the flesh. I don't think he's being melodramatic. I, I think he's really hit the nail on the head. Having gone to Billy Graham Crusades a couple times, uh, having gone to one of his last ones in California, because uh, he visited the town that I was ministering in as a, a, doing youth work, there was this emphasis of having um, Toby Mack and, and the band members up there and really talking about how this confession that the one time we're the most segregated is on Sunday mornings, that we are so separated on Sundays, and yet Christ went into Samaria, went into all these other places, sharing the message of hope that He brings through His death and resurrection for all people. And yet, some reason, we continue to find. Now, I appreciate the boldness of that statement that how we're so segregated on Sunday morning, and it's complicated, right? Because certain people worship certain ways. Our Pentecostal brothers and sisters worship in a way that maybe is a little bit foreign to people who are a much more of a high church or traditional church worship service of a Protestant background or an Anglican background. And so that doesn't mean one's right or wrong. Well, I mean, depending on the priest that you talk to or, or the pastor, they may say this is right and they are wrong. Uh, the best comment I ever heard that I absolutely agreed with and was um, disgusted by at the same time was by a Roman Catholic priest who was giving a presentation at a Protestant seminary, and he, he said, you know, there are many boats in the spiritual ocean. There is one ark, and we're just waiting for you all to get back on board. Okay, fine. So, you know, it, it, it was a great little comment, and at the same time, I'm like, really? Really? You had to just stick it like that? And so, when I think about the diversity of ways in which we worship, that's not a bad thing. What is a negative is when we continue to maintain these separate camps in all circumstances at all times, never coming together for the benefit and blessing of our communities. So that's where I agree with Pastor Rich when he says that it is this deeply embedded thorn in our society, because both inside 
the Christian church in America and outside the Christian church, obviously at around in our nation, it is a deep problem that we're experiencing and have forever. We have, he writes, we have quite simply lost our ability to engage in meaningful conversations that results in effective social transformation. We've lost our ability to talk or engage in the topic because we know our talking points. We have crafted them. We have arrived at what we're going to say. When the issue of race emerges, we fixate on that there are sides on the matter, and everyone claims that they are the ones being demonized for their position. That's something that I've observed. That's not Pastor Rich that said that. And, and when I talk about this, I was speaking with somebody before the class, I wanted to say, you know, I, I want to share a little bit about my story. Um, I have grown up in an environment where I do see the differences throughout my childhood growing up, but I make an effort to just reach out to classmates, neighbors, um, and just befriend them, even if I don't necessarily know what it means that they are Hmong and what their country is like, their nationality, their ethnicity, all their cultural things. I don't, I don't necessarily know all the traditions of their family and their heritage from Mexico, but they are my neighbor, and so then I talk to them. Um, and one of those instances was in the last couple of years getting to know my brother Tyson, who serves uh, the United Methodist Church as a pastor in Peoria, Illinois. Both of us were serving in the same town in Illinois um, when I lived there, and he lived in Galesburg as well. And, and Tyson uh, was serving the uh, AME Church, and the community co came together after the shooting of the, the Bible study group that was happening at the AME, and they wanted to have a, a gathering and prayer, and that's where I met him first. Um, and then he and I just had side conversations together. He's roughly about my age. And they just kind of developed from there. And um, we, along with a couple other congregations in our community, pulled together and said, let's, let's do something that shows that we can come together and have our separate practices or traditions join in and have a worship service in the park, demonstrating that we are united in Christ, because there is one baptism, one faith, one Lord, so let's do that. And the Anglican pastor, priest, and myself, and uh, um, another Reformed church, and then Pastor Tyson and I got together and developed this thing. And it, and it went off, and it was, it, was, it was interesting to see us mix, um, and yet it was kind of from standing back and watching even then, when the, pro, the sole purpose when we talked about what we were going to do and the intent and everybody was on board and excited, the church that came would be over here and we would cluster in our separate pockets even though we were all united. We wouldn't actually integrate. And some people, some elders from my church, I was so proud of them, they did. They just walked right over and set themselves right down in the middle of everybody else and said, yeah, hi, I'm so-and-so and I want to get to know you. And that was, it was fantastic. But the reason why I bring up Pastor Tyson's uh, story with you is one time he was sharing with me and he was so frustrated and I said, you know, what's, what's got you going? What, what's going on? And he said, you know, I want to share with you what it's like to be me. Last night, I was, um, I was driving home from the late show of a movie in our town. You know, so we lived in a small town. And uh, he goes, I, I drive, a, a, you know, my car. It, it's my car. And I'm driving home and going through downtown to get back to my, to my home. And uh, I get pulled over. You know, it's just, yeah, I knew what time it was. Uh, but I just left the movie theater. It was, I didn't think much of it. And the officer instantly treated me as if I was a threat and didn't even do the normal routine of talking to me like, uh, do you know why I pulled you over? He started accusing me of things, and, and he, and all that he tried to do, Tyson says, you know, I, I kept my calm. 
Um, I asked him why I was pulled over because I didn't know. I ha wasn't speeding. I didn't, you know, I used my signal and everything else. I just happened to be one of the few cars on the road going home. Well, it got he a little heated because the, the officer just wouldn't leave it alone. Now, Tyson is um, taller than me, was a collegiate wrestler, has a gold tooth, and dresses really well. And all he could be viewed as by this particular officer was obviously a drug dealer. Tyson's a pastor, and he actually worked on behalf of the city to help people pay off their debts. He worked at the courthouse and knew the head of police, worked with them. And in all that, he was still viewed as a threat. Whereas if I were to drive home, being tired, watching a late movie or whatever, not the same treatment. And so I share that with you, not because I'm trying to make anyone feel awful, but I want you to know what it's like for my brother and his sons, the reality. And so when the nation experiences any tumultuous event, anything, the thought that he and his wife has is, what if that was my son? What if that was me? What if the officer escalated the situation, called for backup, and told me to get out of my car? It's 11 o'clock at night. There are no witnesses. There are no cameras. What if that had happened and it got worse? Now, I understand that this topic, some people might say, okay, amen, go further, say more, be bold. And others might say, okay, you've shared, let's kind of tone it down a little bit. I want to invite you now to feel whatever it is you're feeling. Feel it. And now let's pray together. God, hearing about Pastor Tyson's story, knowing that he is only one of many who experience things like this throughout our nation. Help us to hear what we're feeling. Teach us to hear their stories. And grant us by your Spirit the wisdom to learn. Amen. Pastor Velotas says the only way forward is with the gospel, and to that I say amen. Because you can come up with strategies to educate, which have been done on numerous occasions. You can come up with all sorts of different approaches in policy, but in the end, we know the true hope we have is in Christ. It is the reconciler, the resurrected one, who can bring forth true change in the soul and the heart, because that's where it all begins. And so, Pastor Velotis really points out that it is the gospel we proclaim that must be big enough to engage the realities of racial fragmentation. God is not simply in the business of saving souls. He is in the business of creating a new family. That's going to be one of your talking points, discussing that um, and the breakout sessions to, to kind of figure out how do you feel about that statement. And the question may come up as why this needs to be a priority, and is this anything in Jesus' ministry that could help us kind of navigate this issue? And I love what Pastor Velotis does in this chapter, and he talks about the difference between two of his own disciples that he called, Simon and Matthew. Briefly, Matthew is wealthy. Simon is working class. Matthew made a living off of taking advantage of people who are working class. Simon made a living trying to kill people like Matthew. Now they are both disciples of Jesus. They work together. They learn at the feet of the rabbi. 
they break bread together. This raises all sorts of questions. Despite all their differences, somehow Matthew and Simon were able to remain connected, but it cost them something. Matthew had to stop taking advantage of people like Simon. Simon had to embrace a different vision of the revolution that he was after. And that's the essence of the new family that Jesus is creating, reconciling a community with him at the center. Now, like any word in English, particularly in our modern age, when you start talking about English words, there is a lot of debate about what does it mean to reconcile, whether we can be certain that we are achieving that in our curtain con- certain context or our modern context. So here are some helpful definitions of the act of reconciliation. Dr. Brenda Slater McNeil, who is a uh, a professor over in uh, Seattle Pacific University. She writes, uh, Reconciliation is an ongoing spiritual process involving forgiveness, repentance, and justice that restores broken relationships and systems to reflect God's original intention for all creation to flourish. Another helpful way is to identify key words and properly define them because they all unfortunately get intermixed or used in a way that you say one word like culture, but you're meaning ethnicity. And so it's probably better for us to define then what do we mean by race, ethnicity, culture, nationality, And so, here is what Lisa Sharon Harper did in defining each of these words, and I think this is extremely helpful. Ethnicity is biblical. In Hebrew, it would be goy or am, goyam. Um, In Greek, ethnos. Ethnicity is created by God as people groups move together through space and time. Ethnicity is created by God as people groups move together through space and time. Culture. Culture is something that is implicit in Scripture. It's not necessarily that the word is used when you're looking through your New Testament and trying to find the word culture. It isn't necessarily there. However, Culture is a sociological and anthropological term that refers to beliefs or norms, um, even something like uh, rituals, arts, worldviews of a particular place and a particular time. So culture is, is fluid. So, for example, in the Presbyterian church, when we have a book of confessions, what we say is, at a certain age in the 16th century, there was this confession addressing this issue, and we refer to it as a means of giving us clarity about how they interpreted what it means to be the church. It's an interpretation of how to be the church at that age. We also include the Confession of 1967 and others because in 67, they needed to make a definition of what does it mean to be a Christian church at this time in this age. So they continue to do that. Some have been asking, because of the lack of clarity that is all around us, are we on the cusp of yet another kind of confessional statement? Because it seems to be so confusing. What does it mean to be a Christian church, given all that we see and the lack of ownership of the fact that there might be truth or a singularly defined way of saying this is what it means to be Christian? Maybe I don't know. 
Nationality. Nationality indicates the sovereign nation state where individual is a legal system, citizen. It is a geopolitical category determined by the legal structures of the state. And finally, race. When the word race is used, race is about power. Within, strictly speaking, political terms, it's about dominion. As a political construct, race was created by humans to determine who can exercise power within a governing structure and to guide decisions regarding how to allocate resources. That's the way that Lisa Sharon Harper defines that word. Now, you and I could sit down privately or, you know, have a conversation and debate about her definition, but I merely raise that up because the Pastor Velotis lifts it up, and I think that it's at least useful to say, well, how is he referring to these words? Because, again, race is used so often, and yet it doesn't I don't think that we've all agreed about how we're using it or what the definition means for us. And it might be completely different than the person that we're interacting with or having a conversation or debating about the matter. So um, it's very useful to try and define what do you mean by race so that I can understand, so that we can at least dialogue, dialogue about the issue. James Baldwin says, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. I'll read that again. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. You can't fix broken if you don't want to talk about it. It's true. You going to replace the battery in that clock? No. What clock? I don't see an issue. Why is the remote not working? Have you checked the batteries? Why would I do that? <laughs> to do the work of racial reconciliation is to take ownership of mar the marginalizing ways we see others who are in some form or another different from us. The biggest challenge in the conversation on race is our refusal to do the work of identifying and exposing our individual racial prejudice. We have been socialized to see people in certain ways. This is a problem for all of us, regardless of our skin color. And he talks about this from his perspective as a Puerto Rican, growing up surrounded by Dominican Republican, Dominican Republic people, so that his experience was that Puerto Ricans and those from the Dominican Republic do not get along very adversarial. So his high school environment was certainly all sorts of words were said about, you know, those people, and in turn, same thing back at him. So it's much more than what maybe you and I would be tending to talk about, about white and black or white and Mexican or however we would want to talk about the issue. It is problematic across every group towards another group. So it's important that the church acknowledges that as well when we are talking about this situation. I want to move us along because we're, uh, time just slips away too quickly. Oh, man. So there's much more to go into, but I love the way that, that so if there's acknowledgement that we need to at least take some kind of introspective look and ask the question, what did I grow up hearing about people who are different than us? What was said, not just necessarily among those who I hung out with or my neighborhood, what did they say behind closed doors in my house when I was around grandma? What did Mima say? What did Pop Pop say? What did the extended family say? What was kind of the approach that maybe I just really didn't realize until I stopped to think about some of the things that are said, were said. Um, 
how is that influencing then my thinking and the way I think about others, view others? When somebody approaches of a different ethnicity, what's the first thing? Where's my mind go right away? Where it's the first thing I think of? So those are good questions to ask. And at the same time, it, we can't stop there. We have to, we're being invited by our brothers and sisters of different ethnicities to consider that there's more to be done because there's also the system or the structure in which our nation is accustomed to operating in and that there are problems there as well. One of the, question, one of the, the quotes that he uses is by Dr. Michael Emerson who writes, whites tend to view racism as intended individual acts of overt prejudice and discrimination. Most people of color define racism quite differently. For people of color, racism is, at a minimum, prejudice plus power. And that power comes not from being a prejudiced individual, but from being part of a group that controls the nation's system, which is why Dr. Cornel West has been quoted as saying, justice is what love looks like in public, speaking on behalf of his people and his brothers and sisters. So we are invited to consider biblically why we need to address this. You do not have to go far, but look into the Old Testament from the prophets, beginning with Isaiah and then going through the minor prophets. Time and again, the prophets come forward and saying, woe to you, Israel, woe to you for some of the things that you are doing to your own neighbors and to the alien in your midst. If you remember what I told you when I led you out of Egypt and I gave you the promised land to do this for the widow, to do this for the orphan, and to do this for the alien in your midst. And there's a very powerful and challenging passage in Isaiah chapter 10. Beginning with verse 1, from the New Revised Standard Version, it reads like this. Ah, uh, you make, you who make iniquities, uh, I will try again. Ah, uh, you who make iniquitous decrees, who write oppressive statutes to turn aside the needy from justice and to rob the poor of my people of their right, that widows make may be your spoil, and that you may make the orphans your prey. What will you do on the day of punishment in the calamity that will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help, and where will you leave your wealth, so as not to crouch among the prisoners or to fall among the slain? For all this, his anger has not turned away. His hand is stretched out still." Isaiah warning the people of God of what they were doing. Not some foreign power, but what they were doing to the orphans, to the widows, and to their own neighbors. So the pursuit of justice more often is about taking up one's cause with whoever is in power in whatever context and seeking to work collaboratively to bring fairness just policies, and equitable community life. But, pastor, I don't see color. I just see people. I, I have heard that. I have. And, and it's not necessarily a bad thing because what we're trying to say when we say that is, I see a person, I see a human being, I see someone else, and I want to treat them like that. But Pastor Velotas challenges us with that term and saying, but does, doesn't God see color? And it isn't a negative? And so he quotes the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verse 9 as a reason to reconsider that statement of, but I don't see color. Here's what it says. After this, 
uh, the apostle uh, John is talking here about his vision. After this, I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes of peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. Every nation, every group of people in their own native language, standing before God, before the Lamb of God who is enthroned. So what could we do practically? And this is how we'll close this evening up. Here are some things that we could do as exercises in addressing some of the stuff that we may learn about ourselves when we start to ask these difficult questions. And by no way, and in each of these lessons, do I ever assert myself as somebody who is an expert and I have perfected any of this. I am on this journey with you. This is my challenge. This is something that I try to do on my own as well. So, here are some things that he encourages us to practice. Remembering. It seems like such a simple thing. We're good about remembering certain things, but there are other things we would like to just forget. And so it's good for us to remember and to have others help us remember when we look backwards and not just say, oh, that's exactly how it was because that's how I remember it. And the reason why that breaks down is if you were in a classroom with kids or youth and you ever played the game telephone, you know, our brain does a funny thing with what we remember and sometimes we latch onto certain things and other parts we forget when we look back. And some of the stuff that we forget, we really should remember. And that's why we need to talk with others who are different from us to help us remember in a more holistic way when we look backwards on what was. The next practice is incarnational listening. What does that mean? Well, I have to confess, I've heard of um, active listening. I do this with with couples that I um, do premarital counseling with. It's one of those standard practices on on how to build strong communication blocks. And it's where you have the two face one another, and you look at each other, and you say, say what you'd like to say to them, but keep it brief. And I usually start with her and have her start partly because I want to help her exercise on keeping it brief. And then she says whatever it is that she needs to say, and then he is supposed to repeat back to her exactly what she said without interpreting it with sarcasm or, well, I guess you said because I do this wrong. No, 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 just the exact words of what she said. The exercise is to help them understand that that individual actually heard what was said. It's to help build or rebuild trust when communication breaks down. So I'm familiar with that, but incarnational listening is different. Incarnational listening is where you make the choice as you listen to somebody about their story to leave your worldview behind for a moment, to enter into what is their worldview like. So when I had the privilege of Pastor Tyson trusting me, saying, I want to tell you what it's like to be me and what my sons go through, I just shut up and listen because I have no frame of reference for this whatsoever. And I listened. Enter into someone else's world. Let them share their story, and then then begin to think about what it must have felt like as they're sharing that. Connect 
empathetically with them. Like, the empathy is so key. Empathy versus sympathy is very simple. I lean on Brene Brown for this, and where she's talking about sympathy is like, oh, I'm sorry. And sometimes you're like, well, it's too bad if there's someone in the bottom of a pit. She tells this great little tale about, you know, oh, you're, you're down there. That, that's awful. Um, well, things will get better. Empathy climbs down into the pit with the person who's in the pit and says, I'm so sorry you're going through this, and then just sits there with them and lets them feel it, and you feel it with them, but you're never going to feel it completely. You just are with them. That's what's needed in this enter their world listening, the incarnational. And then lastly, allow yourself to be formed by others. Don't walk away and go, well, whew, that was tense. Glad that's over. Like, you just got to let the tension and let their story walk with you and like revisit it. If you need to journal it out to just kind of release it, do that, and then come back to it and say, why did that make me so upset? What, what was it about it that made me want to just move on? Why did I hope that that conversation finished sooner than it did? Or whatever it is that you're feeling, whatever, whatever emotion comes forward, even write that down. What is that emotion that I'm feeling? Is it anger? Is it frustration? Is it sadness? What, what am I feeling as I hear this story? And that's a way that you can allow yourself to be formed by their story. And then next, lament. Oh, lament is so key, folks. I learned about how important lament was uh, by taking a class on the book of Job, and someday maybe I'll do something about that. But um, my professor was Korean, and he talked about the, he insisted, oh, he insisted that the pastors that entered the pastorate must teach the people how to lament. Is that we're doing a disservice to the body of Christ if we never teach them the importance of lament. It is biblical. It is throughout Scripture. Jesus did it. How is it that we always are fixating on God's got to fix it? Lament. David did it. So many of the Psalms are about lamenting and crying out to God, saying, why does everything suck so bad? Do something, God. That's my paraphrase. David didn't actually say that. <laughs> and then reconciling prayer. As you release it to God, enter into a place of reconciling prayer. Lord, intercede. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, have mercy. Lord, do something to bring about change. And then... <laughs> And this may sound strange because, you know, sometimes it does, but the next practice is to renounce whiteness. And let me explain based off of how he explains what that means because it might be a little bit strange to say that. Renouncing whiteness means acknowledging the lens with which we are looking at the situation, looking at the world, looking at what's happening in our nation, our community. Certain and these are some of the ways in which he's just, he's putting this out here. This is something that he has observed within Queens, New York, and within the New York City area. Certain neighborhoods are deemed inherently better when white people are present and inferior when they're not. Skin color is viewed as inherently superior the lighter it is. Certain hair types are viewed as inherently good, while some are seen as inferior. And then, white people are inherently seen as more reliable, authoritative, and trustworthy than people of color. Just breathe, brothers and sisters. Just breathe. It's good to feel the tension. It may not feel good, but let the Spirit challenge us with this because it is a challenge. It is hard work. But our brothers and sisters in Christ are asking, pleading for us to join them in hearing their story. And so lastly, 
when we feel this and we feel convicted, we need to enter into regular confession, repentance, and seek forgiveness. But forgiveness is a tricky thing. And it's pointed out by the theologian Miroslav Volf, forgiveness flounders because I exclude the enemy from the community of humans even as I exclude myself from the community of sinners. I'll read that again. It's a lot to process. Forgiveness flounders because I exclude the enemy from the community of humans even as I exclude myself from the community of sinners. And he has an entire book on the practice of exclusion as one of the enemies of the human story. It's really intriguing. I highly recommend it. It's, it's dense, it's hard, but it's a very good book. And he's speaking about it as a Croatian. Um, in the, and he wrote it in the midst of the Croatian-Serbian conflict. And about knowing about the tension that existed between Croatians and Serbians. So it's a lot to process, and I know we've gone quite long tonight, but there's so much to unpack. Here's something that I want to leave you with this evening. You're not going to do this on your own. You will not save the world. When we look to Christ, we can be like Matthew and Simon and learn how to break bread. When we focus on Jesus, we can listen, though the conversation is difficult and at times feels impossible. And we can look and say, what might we do alongside others to bring wholeness to our community where it needs healing? Thank you so much for joining me tonight. I have a final prayer that I want to offer for us uh, as we close. Let's pray. O oh God of compassion, upon the people in this land we live with injustice, terror, disease, and death as their constant companions. Have mercy upon us. Help us to eliminate cruelty to, tho to those who are our neighbors. Strengthen those who spend their lives establishing equal protection of the law and equal opportunities for all. And grant that every one of us may enjoy a fair portion of the abundance of this land through your Son, our Lord, Jesus our Christ. Amen. Thank you.